So Nussbaum tries to come up with her own version of uh, an objectivist virtue ethics, somewhat like what Aristotle was trying to do. And the first thing she says we should do to have such a, a virtue ethics is to come up with a list of of what she calls um, universal spheres of human experience, which she claims is what Aristotle tried to do. And she comes up with a, a, a revised version of this. And these should be things in which um, uh, every human being has to make some sort of choice. So human choice is non-optional. That that it should be areas that we all have to choose one way or the other. We all have to act in some way or another in connection to um so that, for example, she says with Aristotle on page 262, she claims that that the, the areas that he came up with, what he was trying to do is to show on the right of 262 that everyone makes some choices and acts somehow or other in these spheres, if not properly, then improperly. Everyone has some attitude and behavior toward her own death, toward her bodily appetites and their management, towards her property and its use, etc. No matter where one lives, one cannot escape these questions so long as one is living a human life. And that's that's the idea of the, the kinds of things she wants to look at um, as universal spheres of human experience. And then also these things, these choices that we make should be somewhat problematic. They should be things that um, are either we have questions about or not simply obvious or that um, that that makes sense to say that one could be flourishing or not in relationship to these by having a, a virtue or a vice in relationship to these. Mm-hmm. After we come up with this list, which she starts on uh, later on in the article, she says we can then, as Aristotle did, give a, a kind of thin conception of the virtues, which just is a description of them as whatever, you know, acting well in whatever these spheres are. So courage, its thin definition is acting well in relationship to fear and confidence about things that can harm you, that can have significant harm to you. Um, or uh, especially for Aristotle, that can kill you. That would be the thin conception of of courage, um, acting well in connection to those types of things. Um, But that doesn't really tell us very much. And so she claims that Aristotle also tried to give a a thick conception of the virtues, so I'm not sure he gave a terribly thick one, which means um, trying to describe a bit further what it means to act well in relationship to each of these areas. So giving a bit more detail about what courage really looks like, not just it is acting well in connection to fear about things that can harm you or kill you. It is uh, a bit deeper conception of what that might actually be. Um, and she claims that Aristotle was was trying to do this and was trying to do it in a way that was objectivist. He wasn't trying, although um, we may disagree on whether he he succeeded in this, he wasn't trying to give thick conceptions that were specific to ancient Greece. Um, uh, she claims that that he does look at some of the things that people at the time thought about some of these virtues and criticizes them. So he's not simply trying to say, well, this is what virtue means in our society. He's, he was trying to aim at something more objective, and that's what she's uh, trying to do as well, I, as far as I understand it. Um, and that's what she claims... Um, uh, uh, ethical theory is is ought to do if you're a virtue ethicist this is where you know in part I mean we need to do one and two as well but but three is a place that we really need to have a lot of work in so she comes up with her own list of possible spheres of human experience that are universal to uh, all humans and I'm curious what you think of this list. So one of them I think is fairly obvious that all humans do um, have to face their own death because we are all mortal. So that's not a problem. We all have bodies and those bodies are similar in in important ways that uh, we all need to sleep. We all have hearts and digestive systems and brains and they are similar in, in very um, uh, in many, many ways, although of course there's going to be differences between exactly how all these things work in our bodies, but she's trying to, to focus in part on, um, the, the specific limitations that a human body has, and those are going to be 
generally similar between people. Um, pleasure and pain, we all have some kind of experience in regard to pleasure and pain. We all uh, tend to to think of pleasures and pain, pleasures as positive and pains as negative to some extent, of course, because um, not all pleasures are going to be considered good and not all pains are going to be considered bad. But, but we have relatively similar uh, experiences in regard to pleasure and pain. At least that that is part of a, a human life that we have. We have those things, and we need to make decisions in regard to them. Cognitive capability. In this one, she refers to a quote from Aristotle where he talks about how we all have some drive to understand that we, uh, I think the idea is that we are, are, we appreciate, we value understanding the world around us or ourselves or other people um, to some extent. And, and of course, this understanding is going to differ widely between people of what they desire to understand and what they can understand and, you know, how far they want to go in knowledge, but um, that that we have some some desire to do understanding and gain knowledge at all, uh, she seems to be claiming is a is a common human trait. We all share a practical reason, she claims, in that that is uh, the ability to make decisions about our lives, to plan, to come up with goals, to work towards those goals. Um, you know, one can one can perhaps question the degree to which everybody is is capable of doing this, but um, unless you are um, uh, in a coma or somehow completely unable to use reason, um, I think that this applies to certainly the vast majority of people that that people do think about how to run their lives and think about what their goals are and work towards those goals. Though it may be possible there are a few who, who cannot do that. Um, infant development there she just says there are certain things that we all share as as infants there are certain you know limitations on infants no matter where you are or where you live you are helpless when you are first born you cannot feed yourself etc and we have to think about um, how we are going to act in relationship to uh, young children affiliation simply being um, the, that we are social creatures we value connections to others that um, these can be small connections family friends they can be large connections to a society and then humor she claims um, let me find the quote on this one 273 um, she says some space for humor and play seems to be a need of any human life. Um, it is certainly one of our salient differences from almost all animals and in some form or other a shared feature I somewhat boldly assert of any life that is going to be counted as fully human. Um, which is an interesting, I think, addition to the list. I don't know. It's not something that I would necessarily have thought of. And these are all, she, she seems to be claiming that um, they are, and I'll quote here from page 272, we can, we can identify certain features of our common humanity. These are all things that um, uh, we, we have to make some kind of decisions in relationship to. These are all things that we have some sort of choices in relationship to. And the way she talks about them Sometimes she'll say um, things like uh, we need to have some capacity for these things or we need to have some similarity in these things to others to be even called human beings. So for example, for practical reason on page 273, she says, all human beings, whatever their culture, participate or try to in the planning and managing of their lives, asking and answering questions about how one should live and act. Um, this capability expresses itself differently in different societies, but a being who altogether lacked it would not li be likely to be acknowledged as a human being in any culture. So that that this is, you know, definitely describing what what we think of as actual human beings, um, and that might make give you some pause. 
Which makes me wonder, do you think there should be anything added or subtracted from this list in your view of things that are universal human experiences? And I'm going to ask you to think about that in a little bit. Um, the, the last part of this particular video is just going to be thinking about Nussbaum's own view in relationship to that, that chart that I gave earlier. I'm going to talk about in relationship to what she describes as, as objections to her view that I don't think she is saying that eudaimonia and the virtues and the virtuous person are relative to culture. I think she's saying that um, we can evaluate these objectively, but there may be more than one answer as to what counts specifically as the virtues and therefore as the virtuous person. Um, so that her view is more like a pluralist view. And I haven't put right action on there as a pluralist only because um, of one thing she says about how uh, even though when we are a vir- when one is a virtuous person, you you may take a general statement of virtue and what it means and apply it differently in different contexts and different circumstances. So what counts as courage is going to look differently in different circumstances. Nevertheless, she claims, um, let's see if I can find the page number quickly. Uh, yeah, on page 270, that um, if another situation, this is on the left of 270 at the end of the first paragraph, if another situation should ever arise with all the same morally relevant features, including contextual features, the same decision would again be absolutely right. By there, I, I think she means that um, there is one decision in any particular context, in any particular set of circumstances that the virtuous person would make. And if the same set of circumstances arose, the same decision would still be right. So I'm not sure if she thinks that right action, once you've got this notion of the virtuous person, and once you understand that the virtuous person could have more than one answer, so there could be a plural view of virtues and the virtuous person, but within each, each view of the virtues of the virtuous person, then the right action is not going to be plural, meaning, you know, whatever that, that view of virtue is, it's going to lead to one right action and not more than one. Um, so I, that's why I didn't quite put right action under pluralist, though clearly if virtues and the virtuous person could have more than one um, instantiation, you could have more than one uh, way of thinking about the virtues that are are legitimate, then what counts as a right action is going to be, there's going to be more than one answer to that, because you've got more than one view of the virtues. But within each view of the virtue, the right action doesn't look plural, it's going to simply follow from that virtue and the particular circumstance. So that's what that hopefully, hopefully that makes some sense. Okay, I'll stop here with this video and then move on to objections she addresses to her view.